Um, I was asked to give this lecture about my mother. Most of you don't know her, some of you actually do. Before I begin, I want to recognize just a handful of people. Uh, Henry Selby is here. I haven't seen him in 35 years. He knew my mother from way back when, and uh, I'm just awfully pleased that he was able to come. And sitting next to him is somebody he does not know, Chris, who's a former student of mine who put together the PowerPoint presentation. I would not have been able to do it without him. <laughs> and of course, I could never do something like this and still go home if I didn't introduce my wife over here and uh, say I couldn't do anything without her. <laughs> This lecture has a strange origin. My mother was an unusual person. She led an unusual life, and she died in August of 2018. She was 86 years old. My first response to her death was a very modern one. It was to post something on Facebook. Facebook allows you to share something where you don't have to say a thousand times, my mother died, my mother died, my mother died, my mother died, as everybody looks at me and feels sorry for me. I could just say it once and everybody could understand. So I typed, my mother passed away, and for the first time in my life, I understood why people said such a euphemistic expression. I have no taste for euphemisms. It always seems silly. What I meant was, she died. So I typed... My mother died. And at that, an emotional wave came over me that is difficult to describe. I was not expecting it. Literally, my words failed me. I was going to say other things, but as I started typing and weeping, I could say nothing more. So I just left it at that. My words have left me. The next day, I could write a little bit more. I said a little bit more. The next day, I wrote a little bit more. I said a little bit more. I didn't say it for other people. I wanted people to understand what my mother was like. I wanted her to understand that I was listening. I wanted her to understand what it meant to me. The post kept building. People kept responding. People came up to me and said, these mattered a great deal to me. My own mother died. My own father died. And I realized that this is a universal expression of emotion that most people, until you experience it, don't fully understand. I didn't understand it. And yet, at the same time, it is such a universal experience. It is shocking to us when it happens. It will happen to us all. So I thought I was tapping into something which is more universal than just me and my mother. <laughs> and I started to think more broadly about the kind of things that I wanted people to understand. One of the things I wanted to understand is something that if you met her, you would have never known. She was a gentle, loving, funny person who just seemed like a little old lady, a pleasant, nice little old lady. You would never have expected that she was a brilliant scholar. You would never expect that she was a groundbreaking figure who got her PhD in the 1960s, for example, who became a philosopher. Who in the world would become a philosopher? <laughs> Whose career took downward turns and upward turns, and through it all she triumphed and found her own way. I thought <clears throat> to myself, I need to tell this story, so I told it in posts on Facebook. Well. Mary Richardson, I blame her. She said, <laughs> you should make this a banners talk. And I said, well, I don't think so. She said, no, it would really be a good lecture. People should hear this story. And I said, well, maybe if the person who's in charge of banners, Brooke over there, came to me and told me what she wanted me to do, I could see if I could do it. So she did come into my office and she asked me and I said, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this because it's an emotional circumstance. I don't think I can do it because the last time I tried to explain to people, I wept. I was before my class trying to teach and all I could do was think, my mother's dead, my mother's dead, my mother's dead. And when I tried to explain to my class that I was having trouble formulating my thoughts, all I could think about was my mother's dead. 
And so instead of explaining to them why I was having a little bit of a distraction response, I just wept. I canceled class. I tried to do it again in the afternoon, but I just wept and I canceled class. I walked into my department head's office and I didn't say, can I go away for a day? I just said, I'm going home. And I left. So when Brooke came and said she was going to want me to talk about this, I said, I don't know. And my posts were 40 pages long typewritten. My posts went from X to Z to Y to A. My posts described a whole life of different circumstances. Sometimes a little story here, a little story there. And I thought, there's no way that I can give a lecture which will encapture this. I'm going to forget stuff. How can I do this? So I wanted to say no. And then I thought, I can't say no. And I've regretted it every day since I said <laughs> yes. I have been trying to understand how I'm going to give this lecture. I've been trying to understand how to draw a big picture. I've been trying to understand how I can do this. And I'm always remembering that my mother was a philosopher. And I wanted to do justice to her philosophical thoughts, and I wondered how that would play over at a banners discussion. And then I thought, well, that's what I posted, so in part, that's what we're going to do. Which gives me my first slide. Don't worry, the philosophy is going to kick in a little bit later as we go in. But this first slide speaks to me. This is actually from the very first section of a book, a book that she wrote about Wilhelm Deltai. As she explained to our good friend Henry Selby, who said, I didn't understand a word of her careful explanation. But the beginning part actually has little to do with Wilhelm Deltai. Man, philosophy originates in man's amazement over the richness and complexity of reality. It attempts to articulate in words and concepts what reality is. All that makes kind of some sense, what philosophy is, abstract ideas. But what I like about this is the very first sentence. Philosophy originates in man's amazement. And the reason I like that is my mother was always amazed. She was joyful about everything. My mother was happy when we served cheese pizza. Not cheese pizza with other stuff on it. No, just plain cheese pizza. Oh boy, pizza. I hope it's cheese. <laughs> yes, it is. Wonderful. A Big Mac? Amazing. This tastes great. A four-star restaurant? This is wonderful. A nice glass of wine? This is amazing. And I remember speaking to her many times when she told me people do not appreciate the richness of everyday circumstances. They don't understand how nice every day is. That there's a sunset every day. That there's food every day. That there's friendship every day. That amazement speaks exactly to what motivated my mother more than anything. And after that, she says, starting from the recognition that this reality is experienced by all human beings, but experienced in many different ways. Each person's life is different. Each person's way of looking at the world is different. Understanding the complexity of everybody's reaction to the world is where philosophy begins, a kind of amazement. The philosopher tries to find reality's heart its center, its hidden treasure, the tree in the middle connecting heaven and earth. That's what this talk is about. It isn't that my mother was the tree. It's that she thought philosophy was the tree. And when Brooke read that, she said, I was really moved by that particular expression. And I thought that is the perfect title for this talk, the tree between heaven and earth. To begin this story, we begin at my mother's beginning. She was born in 1932, August 9th. She had a very distinguished family that I will discuss in a little bit. Most people wouldn't understand the origin of it. 
Her mother's name was Anna. I only knew that just recently, after she died. My mother died, that is. Her father was Jan Rutgers. Jan Rutgers was an engineer. He had a marvelous career as a civil engineer, and he became rather famous in his own right. After Rotterdam was flattened in World War II, my grandfather was in charge of reconstructing it. He was in charge of the civil engineering firm that did it. I have pictures of him, for example, with the Queen, discussing what to do and how to do it. They married, and Anna Palm was a dancer. She was a ballet dancer. She was a dancer whose first performance in Holland was in the newspapers, that level of ballet. But there was a problem, and the problem turns out to be my mother. My mother was born, and for whatever reason, I do not know, but I've been curious about it ever since. For whatever reason, a mother's connection to her child never happened. My mother, on her deathbed, wept as she told me, my mother never loved me. She had told me this before. So when she saw this picture, because at the end of her life, I actually went through picture book after picture book. When she saw this picture, she wept. It was all pretend. She posed for the pictures. But this wasn't who she really was. My mother held it against me that I was born. I ruined her career. That's the reason I never knew her name, I assume. And the other reason you'll see shortly. So a child unloved, born in the Depression, but born in the Depression to a very prosperous family. I love this picture. It shows a little six-year-old girl who was pretty and happy. So despite this, she was able to be poem already something else. And I like this next picture too. I knew, I, I was worried about this. I don't use PowerPoints in my discussion. And I knew if I practice, I could like get it down so I could like click on the thing and not look back. But I also knew, no, there's no real chance. I'm gonna be just like you doing. <laughs> this is my mother with a rabbit. What could express the joy of childhood, no matter what happens, than holding a fluffy bunny in your arms? The Great Depression did not affect them the way that they affected many people, but obviously she bore her own burdens in a different way. And the burden was sharpened in just a moment. This may well be my grandfather, I'm not entirely sure, but it shows you this was actually a very prosperous family. Droste is, by the way, the greatest chocolate company in the history of the world. And uh, if you ever have a chance to get their chocolate. And notice they're going to sell you bonbons. This is my mother. This is her cousin, Heyer. And I'm not exactly sure who this is. This is her aunt, Tante Meep. Uh, Tante Meep would actually come to care for her in later days. So this was very significant sort of image. But I like this image for a picture of what 1930s world she came from. This was all destroyed in 1939, World War II starts, September. Holland is not a part of it, it's expected to be neutral, but the Germans had other plans. Before the Germans evaded Holland on May 10th, my mother and her mother got a passport. They were intending to travel to Indonesia. This is, by the way, the first time when I found this passport, it was by my mother's bedside in a tiny plastic bag with a number of other significant artifacts. I had never seen it before. I asked my mother about what happened, and she told me that just before the war started, they were planning on going to Indonesia, where her aunt and uncle had substantial connections. So they were going to leave before the Germans invaded. If you take a look at the date... It is filled out May 3rd, 1940. The Germans invade Holland on May 10th, 1940. 
and the Dutch fought back more than the Germans wanted. So they responded by bombing a civilian city, Rotterdam, to smithereens. My mother was living in Rotterdam. She was not part of that initial bombing. But there was a follow-up bombing. Five hours before armistice was signed, that bombing destroyed my grandmother's house and killed her. It made my mother permanently deaf. She was a victim of the war. Life as they knew it was shattered. A child seven years old, unloved by her mother, now forced to overcome the death of that very person who even without love would have been the most significant person in her life. There's not much from the house. When I was growing up, this little dog was in my mother's bedroom. I wondered about that dog for years. I didn't know why she kept it. I asked my father about it about 20 years ago. What is up with that dog? It's ratty, it's all that has nothing. What is up with the dog? My father explained to me that my mother had been able to preserve three things from the house that was bombed. A little bowl, a little cup, and that dog. The dog is where she kept her pajamas. In the back there's a zipper. That dog followed her everywhere she went in her life. The last 40 years she spent at a place in Utrecht, and at that particular place overlooking her bed, was that dog. When I went home, the first thing I wanted to do after I knew she was going to die and I say my goodbyes is I wanted to keep that dog. So I did. And I love this just as an image of the tragedy of the situation, as a memory of the tragedy of the situation. My mother's life was destroyed. She did two things after that. First is she stayed with her aunt and uncle. Uh, she made connections to her cousin. These lifelong connections were very significant to her. Her aunt was her mother's sister, and this made all the difference. She felt loved, and she felt part of a family for the first time. And the second, her grandfather had connections in the countryside. So as part of Holland starved, my mother was in the countryside, able to eat. My father went hungry during the same time, but my mother survived. She once told me a story that I always found just quite extraordinary, but she told it to me more than once. I always believe the story she tells me more than once. The ones that she tells me once, ah, the ones she tells me twice. She said she, there was a law. If you're over 16 years old, you were immediately eligible, not just eligible, you were confiscated for slave labor in Germany. So 16-year-old boys would either have to hide or do something else. And as part of the farm that she was in, there were some cousins, not her cousins, cousins of the farmer. They were 16 years old and 17 years old. They were hiding them. They were essentially resistance. But they needed exercise. So my mother was in charge of taking a wheelbarrow out. The guy would hide in the wheelbarrow and they'd cover it up. I thought this was actually rather extraordinary because my mother was not that big. It seemed to be very, very heavy, but he needed to get out and about, so she did it. To me, that was already a testament of her fortitude. Well, one time she was walking along and a Dutchman stopped her. And a Dutchman tried to communicate to her, and she didn't want to have the communication, so she tried to wave him off. But he kept going, it's a nice day, isn't it? And my mother finally looked over, and you could see the hand of the person that she was hiding. <laughs> she quickly tucked it in. Then a German patrol came not far behind. It was an extraordinary life. After the war, 
she found something else she loved. It was a lifelong love. She joined the Dutch version of Girl Scouts, and she went camping. They would go, because this was Holland, on bikes. They would set up tents, and they would group in camps, and she loved it. She always loved it. My mother wanted to camp when she was 82 years old. We lived in Leesville. She wanted to go in our backyard and pitch a tent. So she developed a love, and as she became 18 years old, 1950, she was ready to go off to college. Before she went off to college, she became a nanny for somebody in Switzerland. As part of the arrangement, she took a train to Switzerland, she brought her bike, she brought her camping gear. On the weekend, she was allowed to take her bike and go camping in various places. So this began an extraordinary series of traveling with youth hostels. Notice that all of these are actually in uh, Switzerland, where she's riding her bike up the mountains and down the mountains. There she is at 18. And she took pictures with friends of herself in various different places. This became a yearly, bi-yearly, tri-yearly thing. She went to university in 1950. This was the first time, uh, I don't know, it's not the first time. It was unusual. She was a woman. She was pursuing an academic career. And she was of a handful of women who were doing this sort of thing. She didn't do it to find a man. She did it because she was genuinely interested in a university education. At this particular time, a university education was not common in Holland, period. They have different levels of schooling. And at the highest part of that schooling was a university. It would have been for perhaps 1% of the population. And of that, most of them were men, not women. So she was already a trailblazer. She told me on this last time, she's actually told me this more than once, that her father was opposed to it. She never explained why she was opposed to it. It doesn't seem like the grandfather I know, but it was 1950. Who knows what he was like then? He didn't support her, she said. He had cut her off as a result of her decision to go to university. She went anyway. One of many times. She went anyway. She started making some connections there. She was made different trips. I love this particular thing. Each trip that she made had a different photo album. <laughs> so she went to Italy in the summer of 55. She went to Switzerland and Paris, 50, 52. The Dordogne in 56. Bourgogne in 54. 54, there was another trip to France. Every year had multiple trips. Every year, she took a train, got on a bike, rode that bike for 200, 300 kilometers. Every year, she was stopping 30 kilometers, pitching her tent, going on, taking pictures, pitching a tent, going on. And on that route, this is from her first trek to Belgium with her cousin as well. She's one of the people in the picture. She started to fall in love with history. She was originally attracted to art history, but she discovered she couldn't really do art history. So she started to be puzzled. There she is right there. She became puzzled as to why people made these things in the first place. What was it that caused them to produce works of art? What was it that motivated these fantastic cathedrals that were built? Every place she stopped, she found more and more. So she became intensely interested, not just in history, but in medieval history, which is where she got her first degree in 54. Holland has a different structure than we have, so you can continue on. There's a next level where you start doing your PhD work. We would call it ABD. She continued on. In 57, she finished ABD in medieval history. And my mother became incredibly, not surprisingly, knowledgeable about history. And it was always astounding. Again, you have to remember, she seems just like a nice old lady. So when she starts explaining one thing after another and giving you a little tip as to what this is about, you're like, okay, 
this? Who would be interested in this? Well, I guess you might be now that you're looking at it. But this was on a huge panorama of all sorts of different things. Where we have the demon on this side and the good shepherd with a sheep on the other side. <laughs> and so the history of medieval thought that produced this sort of thing became an interest in theology and philosophy. So she started to read the Christian philosophers of the 11th, 12th, and 13th century. And this uncovered in her mind further wonderings. This is from Italy. The next thing that I wanted there, I'm mean, missing something. There's a little part in here, and I must have just passed it up. There's a little part in here that has a picture of a Roman house. How many of you would recognize that a house is actually Roman? And as a direct result, that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Here she is, just in a normal house on one of the cities that she's in, and she goes, a Roman house, takes a picture of it. She could see immediately that this was 2,000 years old. Does that make sense? And it was that kind of encyclopedic knowledge where you could just start, I wonder why that is, and she would tell me. She could see the Roman foundations of the city of Utrecht and explained it to me. Her love of history became so all-encompassing, there was no museum she could turn down. It didn't matter if the museum was about organ, organ music. It didn't matter if the museum was about high art. It didn't matter about whether the museum was. And I'm not making this up, because I was astounded by it. There it is. How many of you are from Leesville? No, Leesville? Anybody? Okay, so you know Leesville. How many of you know it real well? You know there's a museum there? Has anybody been to the museum in Leesville? <laughs> Only one person has. You know who? <laughs> my wife and my, with my mother. There's a museum in Leesville? <laughs> yes, but you shouldn't go there. Nothing happened there. Let's go. She was giddy about everything. I was like, literally, nothing happened there. She was excited when she got home and explained all about what she had seen. There is no museum she could pass up. There is no historic district that she could pass up. Well, my mother has another side to her that I did not know, and I think it says actually quite a lot, that I never knew this. I never knew this until about 15 years ago. There is an aristocracy in Holland. There's a traditional landed aristocracy, and there is another kind of aristocracy. It is handed down generation to generation. It is only through your male ancestors that you are part of this. It is the Dutch patrician class. If your family has dedicated itself and served the Netherlands for more than, as it says up here, 150 years in significant features, then your name gets recorded in an official registry by the government. You have a signet ring, just like the aristocracy, the sort of thing that you would have long ago put into a mail to stamp it as yours. My mother's last name is Witkers, and it's on the list. She wore a ring her whole life. I really wanted it when she died, but I didn't get it. She had willed it to somebody else, for good reason, but I was disappointed. I'm American enough to not put much value in this. We are all created equal. I probably believe that more than most. And yet, it's just cool. And the thing that struck me about this is, I never knew. My mother never told me. Some people like to pretend that they are better than they are. My mother had the reverse. She never played up to it. She knew exactly what living first class is, but I never knew. She knew exactly the kind of manners that you're supposed to have. It didn't matter to her. She knew how to, which fork to use and which glass to use and all that other stuff. But that wasn't significant. It didn't matter if you didn't do that. It never even occurred to her. It didn't, it occurred to her so little, she never told me. The only reason I know is that ring that she wore. And this was a kind of big deal, it turns out. My half-sister, who's not related to my mother, but related to my father. My half-sister explained to me the significance of the ring. She said, everyone in Holland would know the significance of the ring. That means everywhere she went, they all knew, except her own family, which did not. She also spoke in Dutch, that was highfalutin. 
I didn't know, because I know the Dutch my parents taught me. So it turns out many of the words that I use are very fancy words <laughs> that everybody would go, why is it they're using that word? I mean, that's, that's like what a king would use. Okay, well, I didn't know that. I just <laughs> And I mention that because my father is from the exact opposite background. My father was dirt poor. He was a brilliant academic, photographic memory, loved intellectual puzzles, and the intellectual puzzles that he loved the most were concerned with literature. He went on a full scholarship to a university, again, when this wasn't done. And they married in 1957. When my father met my grandparents for the first time, it was a clash of class, a time when class really mattered. And my grandparents were apparently very disappointed in my mother's choice. They were against the marriage. And my mother was explaining a story, again, that I had heard before, that when they first met, my father corrected the placement of the dishes on the table because the waiter at a four-star restaurant had gotten it wrong. To which my grandparents went, <laughs> and then one of the courses came out, it was pate. My father tasted it and said, that's really good liverwurst. Yeah. And my grandparents went, <laughs> my father thought it was funny. My mother thought it was funny. At the end of her life, she said, that's why I liked him. And my father was actually consistently like that. I inherited his smart-ass sense of humor. <laughs> so it was an odd coupling. My father definitely wanted the class. He came from the utter poverty and low class and wanted to transcend it. But... He liked her as well. He loved brilliance, and my mother was brilliant. He loved beauty, and my mother was beautiful. And hence, in 57, they got married. Very quickly, three children. Not that quickly. Nine years? Six years? Six years. Three years apart. I'm totally apart. Guess which one's me. I'm the little one. My mother, while I, she was pregnant with me, apparently got the idea for a dissertation. And she always felt kind of guilty about that. She put me off in school as early as she could so she could work. She apologized to me on her deathbed for it. I never noticed. Her dissertation is unusual. It was in history, except it was in the philosophy of history. She read Nietzsche. She was very much intrigued by his conception of the meaning of history, how different it was from other conceptions. And she was very interested in the notion of truth that underlies it. Nietzsche doubts the existence of truth at all. She is what we call a postmodern philosopher. Sometimes people can take it in, in some directions which make no sense. My mother's view was that everything is an interpretation, a way of looking at the world. There is no truth because there is no objective feature that we can finally all reach where everybody knows. Everybody is giving their own interpretation. Nietzsche's vision is actually very similar to that, so it's not surprising to me that she was drawn to Nietzsche's work. But it became and evolved into this interest not just in history, but in how to understand the meaning of history. She began teaching at St. Stephen's Episcopal School in Austin. The times were very different, however. I always love this particular feature. My sons went to St. Stephen's in Austin as well, and I looked up one of the old yearbooks from 1968, and there she was, only it didn't even give her name. Mrs. Dr. Frances Bullhoff. Because women don't have their own name, they get their social status from who they are married to. 1968, but the times, they are a changing. In 1969, she got her dissertation 
and completed a degree in philosophy. They know how to do it, I have to admit, in Holland. So this is their actual dissertation in Latin. With a wax, oh, I was going to put that up, but this just came off. With a large wax seal by the rector of the university. I don't know if that's going to say it. The gods are in. Okay. I hope that stays it. In the beginning, there was another culture clash, and I want you to remember the little passage that I wrote about the meaning of life. And I have to admit, I'm a philosopher, but I don't do that kind of philosophy. The questions I ask are very different. The kinds of questions I ask turn out to be something like this by a guy who taught me. Whoops, there's our trip to there, made the front page. Oh, shoot. I told you I was going to forget stuff. I like this story. <laughs> We came to this country in 1966. My father was a visiting professor at the University of Texas. It was only supposed to be one year. He had met somebody when he was in school. And this person became the chair of the department at Texas in Germanic Languages and invited my father over. They liked him so much they kept extending it, but we had no idea that this was what was going to happen. So my parents treated it as they treated apparently everything. Again, I didn't know this. They traveled. They traveled like crazy. They went in their first year in Texas. They went from Austin to Corpus Christi to Mexico twice to Big Bend National Park up to Lubbock over to Huntsville. Yes, we went to see a rodeo in Huntsville, Texas, the prison rodeo, because if you're in Texas, you need to see a rodeo, apparently. This just falls in line with the kinds of things that my mother had been doing all along, traveling and seeing studying and learning, viewing the world from different perspectives. But what are you to do in the age before social media? You want to share your world with the people back home. So you make a scrapbook. And you put the addresses of all the people that you want to see the scrapbook on the front page. And then you scratch out the person who sees it, and they mail it on to the next person. <laughs> And that way, everybody sees your pictures and your commentary. But of course, like Facebook, you have to have commentary. It can't just be pictures. So we get this. <laughs> Austin is hopeless provincial. Well, I guess she didn't quite understand what America can do in 40 years. <laughs> but it's not provincial anymore. But she loved her time there. And she valued it intensely. Even in the beginning, she says, I love the quiet and the fresh air. OK, there's no quiet and there's no fresh air anymore either. <laughs> it looks very different than that picture. But at this part, she laughs because she knows somebody who uh, is from New York. And they came down and they said, this is downtown. And the person from New York just went, <laughs> oh, you're serious. Anyway, so. <laughs> well, philosophy has two different paths. One is called analytic. The other is continental. Continental tends to ask the big questions, gets mystified by the world, plums the depth of the maze, creates the maze so that you can plumb it. But there's another side of philosophy. It's called analytic philosophy. It begins with the suggestion that, in point of fact, there are no philosophical problems. All of them are simply avoidable by clarifying language. But if you're just clear about what we mean by what we say, we can see that there is no thing to work out. Analytic philosophy dominates philosophical departments from its inception, really, in the 1910s especially in the 1930s with a school of thought which is called logical positivism. Anytime that you imagine, for example, that science has evaluative points and data and that all questions are answerable in terms of the data, you are beholden to logical positivism. That is their view. It permeated philosophy departments and it permeated science departments. It permeates the way we think about the world. And one of the originals Turns out to be, oh, I forgot. <laughs> I told you. But I'm going to roll in what's more. I'm running out of time, so this is kind of weird. On the way back from Holland, we all went to Holland for my mother's PhD. On the way back from Holland, we decided to visit Cuba. 
Okay, we were hijacked. <laughs> we were hijacked by a 90 degree turn between Florida and Houston. I remember this vaguely. There are flashes that I remember. Uh, and there are significant events from the trip that I remember. But my brother apparently remembers the actual the 90 degree turn and he thought, this is not right. And he tells me years later, but I don't believe it, that he figured out right away we were being hijacked to Cuba. <laughs> He's being... Anyway. That's my brother. But my mother didn't. So as we landed into Aeroporto de Havana, she said, I didn't know Houston had palm trees. <laughs> As she came out, she very quickly realized what was up. This was not an act of terrorism. This was an act of somebody who really, really, really wanted to go to Cuba, and there were no planes to Cuba, so the only way you could go was take a gun and hijack your plane to Cuba. You can see these guys here. These are soldiers. They're in uniform. And everybody's kind of gathered, apparently, going, what the hell is up with this? They gave all of the children a glass of orange juice and a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> I had lost my pack of cigarettes. I claim I'd lost it. I found it. My mother had kept it. We still have the pack of cigarettes that was gone. She came back with her PhD. My father was offered tenure at the University of Texas. It was a different era then. They were desperate for people. They liked my father's teaching. He was a very good academic person. So after three years, they offered him tenure. My father accepted it, but wanted a spot for my mother as well. The history department made a spot for my mother. So she was a professor of history at the University of Texas. In her introductory, I told you there are different schools of thought. You remember the amazement about reality. I want you just for a second to follow what's being said. Understanding it is not at all required. I love the fact that actually I understand it, that this actually not only speaks to me, but I can argue with it, and in point of fact, this is important. It's only important to someone like me. Consider the sentence, this is red and this is green. Call it A. Assume that A, the two occurrences of this refer to the same color spot. In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein claimed A is contradictory. The claim has provoked many varying reactions. One of the persons who is given here is Gustav Bergman, who was one of the very first logical positivists and part of the Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle was an intellectual atmosphere of people who created logical positivism. Freud attended and various other intellectual dignitaries attended. If you were an intellectual figure in Vienna, you were part of the Vienna Circle. It was all destroyed by the Nazis. Many of them were Jewish and had to flee. Those who weren't Jewish were opposed to the Nazis, and they had to flee. Gustav Bergman is one of those. And he ended up, at all places, Iowa State University. Many of the other people go to like Princeton, UCLA, but Bergman, good philosopher, went to Iowa State. And one of his graduate students at Iowa State was Edwin B. Allaire, who eventually made his way to the University of Texas. He had been chair of the philosophy department, before going to Texas, and he arrived in Texas at the same time that my mother accepted her spot, 1969. So they both were at the introductory session, new faculty. My father was there. He's the first one who told me this story. Edwin B. Allaire, whom I actually like. I did not know this story when I liked him. He was a professor of mine at UT. He was very tall, and he was very charismatic, and he was very abrasive, I suppose, in a way that I actually thought was kind of charming. And he taught courses about this kind of stuff, and it didn't make any sense to me then either. <laughs> he stormed up to my mother at this introductory thing and said, what is a woman doing in philosophy? My mother was not the sort of person to be bowed. She had lived through too much, but more, she didn't even understand this. What in the world could you mean by that? Why not? So at this introductory faculty meeting, they went at it, apparently like cats and dogs. My father, who was used to social criming, 
cringed the whole time. <laughs> My mother, who wasn't, just bowled her way forward. To me, that always says a lot, but I heard this story from my mother's point of view as well. She was less dramatic about it, but she said, yes, that did happen. She taught at the University of Texas for six years, came up for tenure, but was interested in a number of different things, and the sexism of this particular time uh, was a little bit obscure. That is, who knows what the actual cause of it, but she did not get tenure. She published a remarkable amount of articles. Actually, I'm still just amazed throughout her life just how much the woman published. But it wasn't enough. Her teaching evaluations were strong, but if you know anything about the University of Texas, that never mattered either. So it was unclear. I think ultimately it happened to this. My mother was interested in an interdisciplinary field, the mixture of philosophy and history. She was doing not history, but the philosophy of history. What does it mean? Why are we studying this? How is history supposed to speak to us? And it turns out there are various different attitudes towards that. And as she pursued her interest in the notion of interpretation and how it intersected with history, the history department said, that's not what we want. So they let her go. The way the tenure works is if you don't get tenure, you have one year to find a new spot, and then you are terminated. 1977 was not a good year to be terminated. Well, first I have to give you this slide. This is me at a happier time. 1976, Christmas, can't be Christmas. My mother's job loss plunged us into financial insecurity. She was really unable to do anything else but academia. She wasn't easily able to go someplace else. But universities had constricted in a way that we didn't fully appreciate. I didn't appreciate it. That is, universities had expanded dramatically in the 1950s and 60s. It had expanded for a variety of reasons. There was a lot more wealth in the country, so a lot more people could afford to send their children to college. A lot of people thought of college as the way in which you make social progress as well. You, you improve your class standing. So instead of 1%, instead of 10%, the number of people who were going to college was larger and larger. It's still increasing today. And in the 1960s, the war took place. And so people had an extra incentive. If you are in college, you get to avoid the draft. And so many people went to college just to avoid the draft. So there was a huge explosion of need for professors. But by 1977, that had entirely collapsed. And in 1977, all the people who were there at these various schools had tenure. There were no spots that were open. And instead of having a trade where you have pages and pages of openings, good openings, good jobs, you had four pages, almost all of them temporary. The jobs for philosophers, which is literally what the magazine is called, collapsed. And it was at that time that my mother started looking for another job. She searched and searched. She was like second and thirds. She never got the top billing. So the first step of the destruction of my family took place in 1977, as we now tried to live up my father's income, which turned out to be not that great because Texas didn't pay that well either. If you look at the picture, you can see my oldest brother. He's just about to leave. He transgressed some rules of my father's and my father kicked him out. A traumatic situation for an 11 year old boy. Then my middle brother, he left. He went to university up at the University of Rochester. It was too expensive to bring him down, and he wasn't really interested in coming down either. So I hardly saw my brother. When I did, he went off with his friends. Then in 1981, my parents informed me that they were divorcing and that they were leaving to go to Holland. I never actually realized that this happy family, which I consider myself a part of, completely blew up. So that five years later, there's just me and my oldest brother. He came back. 
when my parents left to go to home. I didn't realize that until I was posting these things and I started to think, how strange. I think it's still strange. But my mother went to Holland. My father went to Germany. My father was offered a great job. And that's why he went. He started a new life with a woman who would eventually become his wife. The University of Texas, as I said, didn't pay well. But they would pay well if he did one thing. If he got a job offer from someplace else, the University of Texas would match it. So the standard way in which to get a raise was to get your salary matched. You know, that's... So my father produced. My father, knowing the game, I told you, he's a climber. Knowing the game, produced three really top-notch articles in one year and kept producing. And then he went on the market. And he got an offer from a German university to set up a Dutch program. My father was teaching Dutch at the University of Texas. And the offer came in, which was at that time, $80,000 as a salary. Well, the University of Texas does not offer $80,000 to professors, not in 1970. They offered him 35. He said, I was going to stay. The whole point was just a bargaining chip. See ya. So he left. He started a new life. He started a new life with a new family. A couple of years later, they had my half sister, Quincy, whom I love. My mother started a new career as well. The new career began with a book on Willem Tiltai. I pronounce it like my mother did this. I am a, uh, Brooke, what am I to do? It's 7.50 and I have only reached this part. What do you want me to do? Keep going. <laughs> Tiltai was a German intellectual. Uh, 1833 to 1911. He was at the cutting edge of this movement to stop thinking in terms of truth, that what you think of as truth is actually just a viewpoint, just an interpretation. Objectivity is important. But then what? What do we do? Like many intellectuals of his day, he had lost faith in the Christian religion in which he's raised. In his college years, he turned from theology to philosophy, in particular to the history of philosophy and to human thought in general. What he was actually interested in was the Reformation. And he wanted to understand the various viewpoints that were feeding it. So in order to really do history, he needed to do the history of thought. And in order to do the history of thought, he had to think in terms of interpretations, that these people were looking at the world in a different way. So he's trying to struggle with the meaning of history. And he started to come up with this. He realized that the center of reality's made, he found the insight that reality, as faced by man, is comparable to a literary text. For my mother, this is extremely significant. It means something to us. It turns out if you actually read her book, it has many different meanings. But the idea is, just like a text, you read it, but there's no universal interpretation of what is the meaning of it. It means something to you. It can mean something different to you than it means to someone else. And she started to think at the bottom part that lifestyles and cultures are lived expressions of the way you view the world. So that the historical artifacts become their own kind of text. That the historian is like a reader of the text. And as you start to think of it as an interpretation, you start to think of it as a work of art. I don't mean that just merely stylistically. I mean literally, a creative weaving of a story given the starting points. The different historians will read it differently. The people of the time will read it differently. The facts are fixed, but the meaning is not. And sometimes you'll pick different features of the text as important. And sometimes you'll pick different features of history as important. And so it became less there is this thing called history, and I'm studying it, and more. The creation of it is itself 
a creation of art. So the people in history are creating an interpretation. And the people studying history are creating an interpretation. And we who are reading the history books are creating an interpretation. The levels never end. The maze never ends. Well, that was Dilto's view. This still did not get her a job. She wrote articles. She published a book. And this book dealt with what he called the hermeneutical interpretation of history. What I mean by hermeneutical in this particular context, which I guess, I don't, uh, if I say this particular context, I'm just like thinking, unless you've done some weird philosophy, you've probably never heard of the word hermeneutical. Okay. <laughs> Hermeneutical means interpretation, and it turns out when it came to religious texts, this is where it all was inspired. You can read the Bible in different ways. The first place in which you can read it is what they call philology. There's an ancient text using ancient words in order to understand it properly. You need to understand what the word meant to the people who are writing it. You need to understand the context in which it was written. You can't just pretend that you can just pick it up and read it as the word because it's in ancient Greek. And ancient Greek has very different meanings than what we have today. So if you want to read the text well, you need to study ancient Greek and Hebrew. That would help. And ancient civilizations, that would help. And then you can start to weave backwards. That's called philology. But there was another view. There was another view which actually is practiced by most ministers, my wife included. The other view is that the significance is not the word, but the message. That there's communication happening between the divine and you when you read the text. The text is a message. And the message will appear and be interpreted differently in different times to different people. Because it's a message for you. It's a message for your culture. Cultures change. The message responds to what's happening in people. Hermeneutics apparently, and I only just discovered this because I read the book. <laughs> Hermeneutics comes from Hermes, the messenger of the gods. <coughs> So the study of interpretation, not in terms of just what the words mean, but how it should affect your life, how it should change you, how it should affect you. This is called hermeneutics. And so the suggestion, you can now see it between history. Can you see it between history? This idea of the interpretation, that the interpreter has a role, that is created by the interpreter in part, that you come together with the text and figure out what it means. Well, I mention that because it's deeply connected to the earlier work, because I told you she came to this sort of thing from the history of art. And in the history of art, she wondered what these people were doing, why they were doing it. And she read the philosophy and she was impressed by the saints of old. She was deeply impressed by the saints of old. She started somewhere to have seen the light. I don't mean that lightly. Ha! Sorry. That's terrible. But I can't help it. I mean she saw the light. An instance of what you and I would call enlightenment. A mystical expression of the very nature of truth. She got it. But in 1957, she had married my father. And she said to my father, I'm thinking of converting to Catholicism. My father was not very religious. Uh, my father had been. He lost his faith in World War II. There were things I've seen you can't explain. So when she said this, my father fell out of his chair. What the heck is going on? 
My mother did not describe this with any regret. My mother described this literally on her deathbed as this was a path not taken. In a strong sense, she's going to come back to it. She did come back to it. She comes back to it now. She had no regrets. She made the choice that she wanted to make, but it was a path not taken. She had applied for a couple of jobs and she had set something up in Holland. She too needed to live for a new life. She had two positions that were available. So she was going to split her time. But she had applied to the Catholic Theological University of Utrecht, connected to the University of Utrecht. And in that, they said, no. They said, you are overqualified for this job. You have 50 publications, two books, published in German, published in English. We're just looking for somebody to teach this course and this course. You are overqualified. To which she responded, shouldn't I be the one to say whether I'm overqualified or not? They agreed, she should be. Then they called her back a little bit later. We can't give you the job, you're not Catholic. It is the Catholic Theological University, after all. But my mother wrote a letter to them. She wrote a long letter. And in this letter, she explained her Catholic leanings. These were more than just leanings. So we can read in an interview that she put out after the newspaper. In 2006, there's a newspaper, it's a nation, national newspaper in Holland called Trau, which means faith. It's one of the big three newspapers in Holland. And they had an article which was called Useful Thoughts. And the question which was asked in the article is, how is philosophy useful in your everyday life? The response to which was probably not what they were intending. But she gave an intellectual history, and she gave the same intellectual history to me long ago, and she gave it on her deathbed once again. Because on her deathbed, I knew that there would be an element that would happen which might be missing. I knew, at some level, she was likely to still be Christian at some level. But I knew that nobody else was paying attention to that part of her. She had been part of a spiritual growth group which was focused on Eastern thought. That's part of the story. They weren't Christian. But I knew my mother had converted to Catholicism after this. And I knew she had never rejected it. And I know she always enjoyed attending church. She took communion in church. So I asked her, are you Christian? And her response was classically philosophical. No, 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 no. Well, yes. <laughs> and the significance, I think, of that is in this history, I started, there are a number of different levels of this, I started my studies with medieval philosophy after many wanderings, including an anti-metaphysical period, I became increasingly interested in metaphysics in recent years. By which I do not mean to say that I return to our traditional metaphysics without more. I am now looking for a metaphysics that is of this world, where the divine in this world, and in which place time and transitoriness take a positive place. Well, what strikes me about that is, even in 2006, she's referring to the divine, but she wants the divine in this world. This is actually what struck her so much about the saints of old, that they had been touched by the divine, that that made sense to people in the Middle Ages. A saint actually communes with God Almighty, not the rest of us, a saint. They're special. Why? Only God knows. But they're special. And my mother loved that God was present in this world. She loved the artifacts that were apparently imbued with the divine nature. She loved God being part of this world. Translated into our metaphysical tradition, this would mean that truth 
and good can be realized in us and therefore in this world, not by doing good things, it's not about you being moral, but by realizing in yourself the idea of the good. The idea of the good is very, very platonic, which she immediately mentions the form of the good, the very nature of goodness itself. You can be transformed by that idea. It can shape you, change you, make you spiritually grow. You become better as you have this divine, mystical interaction. You become transformed. And hence, Plato essentially said the same thing. Contact with the idea of good makes you a better person. This is all the kind of thing that she would have been thinking in the early 1980s. Plato, Plotinus, who's a Neoplatonist from the early 100s, the medieval Christian philosophers, the very saints that she was reading before, and then her thought moved to a new place between 1980 and 2006. The Kyoto philosophers share the same idea, namely the idea that there is something like spiritual growth a deep transformation. And hence, just as contact with God can do you good, you can also communicate in a variety of other ways. The message can reach you through a direct interaction with the Almighty or through texts or encounters or abstractly through beauty and goodness with the good, the beautiful, the true. Yonder, I like this word yonder because my mother was actually speaking this in Dutch and she uses an ancient weird word which we would normally think of as further, but we use further, so the translation was yonder. Yonder, not because it is far away, not because it's some heaven that's displaced, not because it's far and you somehow get to die and go there. No, yonder. But to get there, it's within yourself. The divine is present in you. To get there, there are many barriers to be overcome. Things in the way, your ego, your trauma, things that stop you. But when you overcome it, therefore, yonder. Well, my mother would have said the exact same thing in that letter. And so what she was saying is essentially, I'm one of you. I'm not just somebody who's been writing about the philosophy of history and knows the history of philosophy. I'm a deeply spiritual person with a connection to the divine. And nothing is more important to her than that connection. She got the job. So she started teaching at the Catholic Theological University. She made many different colleagues who affected her the rest of her life. She drifted into more properly religious thinking. She would come back to it in a rather novel way. But she wrote various things on what they call negative theology, which fits my mother perfectly. It fit my mother perfectly because she's very suspicious of truth and reason. She doesn't think that reason can find the truth. Something irrational might, just like the saints of the 11th and 12th century. And so, you study God by saying what he is not. Any attempt to capture his nature within words is wrong. God is not good. God is not bad. All of these are human concepts, human constructs, and you cannot capture the divine in human constructs. And yet it's still shocking, isn't it? God is not good. Negative theology, defining it in terms of what it's not. Well, what to do now? I like this particular part of the story. In, uh, she started working on a new book. I went to Holland. I went to the land of my birth. I went to it as an exchange student. I was taking Dutch, and I was tired of the University of Texas. I was tired of them always asking me, by the way, do you see how odd it is to say how useful is philosophy and to give that answer? 
<laughs> you get to touch the nature of the divine that will change and fundamentally affect you. Uh, I was talking about, you know, what helps you on your day to life. That is my day to day life is what she's saying. Well, I was tired of the anti-intellectualism at the University of Texas. What are you majoring in philosophy? What are you going to do with that? <laughs> What are you majoring in? Philosophy. What are you going to do with that? You're going to flip burgers? Ah, ha, ha, ha. I'm in Dutch. There's a language. They're teaching me my language. That seems a little bit fishy, but I never knew the structure of it. I never knew the spellings of it. I never knew the grammar of it. I just knew what my parents said. So I took Dutch. Lovely little man taught me Dutch. André Le Papa. He was actually a brilliant scholar as well. And he passed out a little leaflet that said, would you study abroad? And the study abroad program was to Holland. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> so I applied, I got in, and I went to study in my homeland as a foreign exchange student. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent a year in Holland. And it was at the same university that my mother was teaching. I got to meet her at least once a week. She fed me, of course. That's what mothers do. And we had conversations. I'd already gotten into a little bit of philosophy. I wasn't very good at it yet. And we continued these conversations for years to come. But she told me that her book, Freud and Holland, there she is in her little office. In her little office. Being an academic, right? I mean, it's, this is an action photo. <laughs> This means Freud and Holland. The Netherlands and Holland is the same word. She told me as I came in that it had become a bestseller. And I didn't pay much attention to that because that just seemed too weird. My mother could be very weird, so I just figured this is just one of those things. I lived in a student flat with 14 other people and one very bright medical student, we all lived together, came in and he said, I saw your book in the bookstore today. And I went, what? And he goes, your book. I mean, it's everywhere. I can't believe it. And I went, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he said, oh, it's not really you. There's this person called with your same last name, and she has a book in the bookstore. And I went, is her name Ilsa? Yes. And that's my mother. Now he went, are you for real? Because <laughs> for all he knew, he was a practical joker. Maybe this was a practical joke. But I knew right then, my mother had become a star. She went from not being able to find a job to having a best-selling book, not just a best-selling book, but a best-selling book in philosophy, an academic book in philosophy, an academic book in philosophy and history. Well, that was not normal. All I can say is Holland is a very different country than this country. <laughs> but like Barnes and Noble, they would have this, I went to the bookstore myself, they have a very famous bookstore in Utrecht, and they had a book right at the promotional thing, and I went to the bookstore, and sure enough, the very front promotional book was my mother's book, just stacked up one after another. I mean, a serious intellectual star. I knew her academic life would be very different from that moment on, and it was. And then just extraordinary change from not being able to find a job in 1980 to suddenly being famous. It was quite extraordinary. Freud and the Netherlands did exactly what the kind of thing that I'm hinting at. There are interpretations of Freud, and my mother was starting to think that science was like history, that it was a creative endeavor that interpreted the world that it was far more than just data, that it was an act which had meaning. And that maybe the scientists themselves are more artistic and literary than anybody else was thinking. And so she investigated two primary figures, figures that might be bigger in Europe than in this country, Freud and Darwin. With Freud, she showed how his literary techniques fed different interpretations. And by doing that, she started to show the influence of Freud's thought in Holland. She started in 1900 and went through to the war. 
And by doing so, she captured not just these different ways of understanding Freud, but how intellectual development occurred in Holland, the different schools of thought. She paid attention to minor thinkers who read Freud and major thinkers and derivatives of Freud's thought. She saw how his work echoed like ripples in a lake. And she did it in a way that people, ordinary people, not just academics, would buy the book and read it. It was an extremely well-researched text, which then led to her work on Darwin. You can kind of get a sense of what the work on Darwin is by something that she wrote. Modern time science has avoided the rhetorical and poetical forms, hallmarks her brevity and exactitude with a disdain for non-functional ornamentation. This book shows that the language of scientists does remain language. Skillful use of its rhetorical and poetical aspects often determine the facts and the transmission of information. Now, immediately, if it's more literary than we realize, using metaphors, for example, it will naturally lend itself to different interpretations. So behind this is exactly that there are different interpretations of Darwin, that he knew that he was using metaphors, that he understood those metaphors would speak to the people of his day, that he was being an artist trying to communicate a message to an audience. And that those metaphors, we have forgotten because we take them literally. We think about natural selection, for example, forgetting that Darwin himself refers to it as a metaphor. He refers to it as a metaphor because you have artificial selection. And so you're saying it's kind of like that, except instead of people choosing, the forces of nature, put that in scare quotes, are choosing. One after another of the metaphors in Darwin's work, she shows how they spoke to people of 1850 and 1860, that it wasn't just the facts which made Darwin successful. It was the literary aspects of his work. Darwin, in The Origin of Species, wrote, my mother wrote, a literary masterpiece. And then she breaks it down further. The importance of language in science has ontological implications as a question about the nature of reality. Science can no longer be considered an action performed by a speaking subject on a mute object. Does the creative role of language in science mean that human beings create the world? She rejects that. Just like Diltai, the facts in some sense are fixed. When you're a historian, you can't just ignore them. So too with the world, you can't just ignore it, but you weave together a story. So the author emphatically rejects a conclusion which would degrade nature to a mere malleable material at the mercy of human beings. A hermeneutical model for the relationship between knower and known is suggested. A creative interaction between reader and text. The reader's, res I love this particular part. The reader's responses actualize the text meaning. The text doesn't mean anything unless somebody's reading it. It's just scribbles in a book. It means something when you make up the words, the science is the meaning behind it. So the reading, the interpretation, there are lots of interpretations. There are lots of interpretations which have never even been thought of. But when you read it, you think of it, you actualize a potential meaning. Scientists give their responses to reality by actualizing one of many possibilities. The world is still a text. The scientist is still offering an interpretation. The experiments are a way of actualizing reality. You could have thought of it in a different way. You could have given it a different metaphor. Science would have gone in a totally different direction had it not been for Darwin. A different interpretation would have been suggested. Not necessarily better, not necessarily worse. Different. And all of these things then get actualized in a different way by the further researches of other scientists. 
each one interpreting what Darwin was saying in a particular way until now it has less metaphorical meaning. You're, you mean this, but it's still an interpretation, a metaphor. Well, there's a little part that I wanted to go to, but it's getting already a little bit late, so I'm just going to skip through to a couple of parts. Uh, she got a promotion. I love this particular promotion because the first time I heard it, it was in 92. She became what is essentially a chair of philosophy at the most prestigious university in Holland, the University of Leiden. So she spent a split time between the University of Leiden and uh, the Catholic Theological University, where she continued to, to teach as well. Her official title, of course, you can read the Dutch, so I won't read it for you. <laughs> Sorry. She is the special professor of philosophy on the relationship between philosophy and the Catholic Church. So she was supposed to address philosophical questions as to what, the, if, you, you know, if, you, if you wanted to know what the Catholic view of that was, you would go to my mother. She was an official source for that sort of thing. Does that make sense? But I love this because the Zumbu, which to me meant special, wonderful. If you had a really nice meal, it would be besonder. Does that make sense? So I was teasing my mother, and I said, wow, you're a besonder professor. And she says, she said meekly, yes, that's my title. The full thing is the title, it's this line, right? So, the Hatbau Stichting und Wetenschaftliche Unterwäsch. Right, of course, I don't need to read the Dutch for you guys, I know. I can only play that joke twice more, and then it will get it'll be <laughs> In 1960, uh, 1997, she had to retire. They have a forced retirement in Holland at age 65. She was very disappointed by this. She was disappointed because she still felt she had so much more to say. Uh, she didn't really mind the rule. The rule opened up academia for younger scholars. It opens up jobs, but it forces retirement. They gave her a huge presentation where people came together and gave talks in honor of her work. Uh, and this was a whole photo album of different people who were coming and talking to her. She was very moved by all of this. And then, at her height, tragedy took place. She suffered from breast cancer in 1999. I don't think I realized the trauma that took place to a woman's body until actually only recently when they cure cancer. I had a student, she was 30, and she had breast cancer and needed a double mastectomy. And she was describing all the pain and suffering that she was going through as you have an amputation and the wound doesn't heal. And for years, it's a problem. My mother never talked about that sort of thing with me. She never talked about her illness. Even years later, she didn't. She just survived it. She survived it in the way in which when her ankle was shattered at 65, it was. They told her she wouldn't walk again. She walked again. She persevered. They did radiation therapy and took out her lymph nodes. And years later, she was successfully cured. You can put that in scare quotes. And she said this had a deep impression on her. Already she'd been playing with Zen meditation to try to get back to that mystical connection. <clears throat> and she got deeper and deeper into Zen meditation. And that little bit in Tao is actually connected to a much longer passage. And the first thing she suggests is that philosophy can get rid of your hang-ups, but that's not what she's interested in. She's interested in this yonder. I'm going to actually skip to that to get there. And so she still is connected to the notion of spiritual growth. Just as contact with God can do you good, we've already seen that before, but it's significant. So her deep connection to Zen made her think things like this. This was a note card my mother had in her house, like a reminder that she had posted someplace to keep herself 
in the moment. In 2011, just after International Women's Day, the University of Atlanta decided to honor women full professors who had been part of the university. This is the Senate room of the University of Atlanta, where actually only full professors were allowed to even enter. They do honor well in Holland. <laughs> but normally there are 100 men up on the board and only one woman. And they decided to cover the men and put women up. And that's my mother right there. One of the older ones who's present. This is her in front of her picture. <coughs> this is actually her in Welsh. Uh, at the Lake regatta. Arthur. Lake Arthur, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, you can see her ring. It's right there. She came to Welsh in May. And Lake Arthur. She was very healthy. One of the stories that I really liked about her stay was uh, one that she didn't mean as a story. She visited my brother before she visited me. My mother loved her morning coffee. There was a Starbucks about a mile, maybe a mile and a half uphill between my brother's house. And she walked every morning there and back. <laughs> she was very healthy. But then she was not. I have a series of communications from her, from her sickbed, where she's all surprised by everything that's happening. And she doesn't describe it accurately. She says she's very tired and a lot of pain. She had what they call pleurisy. Pleurisy is inflammation of the lining of the lung. It's very painful. She meant to just go in and get it checked, but when they took some tests, they decided to keep her. She never actually got home. They didn't know the cause of the pleurisy. It could be caused by a virus, it can be caused by bacteria, it can be caused by cancer. It was a symptom, not a disease. It's not fatal, just very, very painful. They poked and prodded her for several weeks. They took biopsies, they gave her antibiotics, nothing seemed to help. They did not find cancer, they did not find bacteria, they did not find a virus. They wanted to do more tests to try to find what the cause of it was. She decided she didn't want to be poked and prodded anymore. She was not eating or drinking very much. I got a note asking me to come. My uncle sent me an email saying, you should come soon. This is going bad fast. I was just supposed to teach this semester. I found it difficult to think of how I'm going to do it, but when you get a note like that, you go. So I went. My mother and I spent hours with photo albums going through her story. It was actually fairly delightful. She seemed quite happy, but she wasn't eating very much and she wasn't drinking very much. She had pain medication. She took it when she needed it. The doctor called me aside. He wanted to talk to me to explain what was happening. I kind of already suspected what was happening. He explained that pleurisy isn't fatal. But they don't know what the actual cause of it is. It could be a virus, it could clear up. It could be a bacteria, we haven't figured out what the antibiotic for. It could still be cancer. It could have come back. They don't know, but she needs to eat and drink. If she doesn't eat and drink, she'll die. She, she'll die not from lack of food or water, but because her body will become weak and it will catch something else. <coughs> so if she doesn't eat or drink, she will die. My mother had already previously written me something. She wrote me an email on 
July 26th. She had entered the hospital on July 12th. And she wrote, my position is that I do not want to fight against the flow of life. Call it nature, stoa from stoicism, God, true nature, Buddhism. I am at peace with this. It makes me feel good. When I read that, I thought my wife, my wife, Freudian slip, my mother, true Freudian slip, my mother had chosen the path that she wanted to go. The doctor, when I saw him, confirmed what I had suspected. She had never got home. She had only checked into the hospital. She had only checked in for a test. She never got back. She really wanted to say goodbye to her neighborhood, to her house. This is Angela with my mother in the hospital. You can see it's kind of hard to think she's going to die. She seemed so happy. She was happy when I was there. On the way between the hospital and the hospice, we stopped by her house. There's my brother in the background and my son with her. Notice Roger is taking a selfie. <laughs> he is a product of the modern age. There's the selfie. She went to the hospice. It was hard for me to believe that she was going to die even as I said goodbye. It's hard for me to believe because our conversations were very normal. It's hard to believe because she was very happy. It's hard to believe because the picture of her smiling looking at this picture is the picture that I said goodbye to. But that's the way it was. I had to leave to come back and teach. On August 15th, I came back to Lake Charles. My other brother was able to go in the meantime. Six days later, she was unresponsive. And on August 26th, my brother's birthday, my son's birthday, on August 26th, she died. Before she died, she gave an interview, not right before, she gave an interview with, and I find this a little bit weird, it's in Dutch, DreamNet. My mother continued to travel. She went to India in her 80s for two months to practice Zen meditation with a master. She was really serious about this stuff. She went while well, she was in her 80s to Siberia too, but that's another story. When she came back, they asked her about her experience. And she said, what, the question was, what did you learn when you went on this retreat? In this retreat, I realized that dreams come from somewhere from the other side of rational thinking. You normally live largely in a world manufactured by concepts. The world as a dream. This is an illusion. We think about it through these concepts. But for my mother, these concepts were false. To get to the truth, you have to experience. But to get to the truth, you can't use words. It's irrational. It's beyond reason. So in this state, I perfected this. A dream from which you can awaken. Awakening is a form of letting go. The atmosphere of my dreams in the retreat was a kind of like present absence of the ego, what we call ego death in the study of Buddhism. You lose yourself. You become one with the world. During the retreat, I got a stronger sense of free at last, of letting go. I experience that now as I get older during the day. I notice that letting go also from good things can be nice. I experience that openness in dreams. I think that my mother 
from the moment that she had breast cancer, struggled with her mortality, came to this vision of truth and beauty and goodness, mystically that she was connected to from the 1950s, and developed it even more so that she could let go, which she then did. And hence the title of this talk, which I will add is even more present. As my mother wanted a burial that paid attention to her beliefs, she wanted to be part of the circle of life, that death was not an end, and it is an end, that it's all part of this thing called life, this experience that she had. So she wasn't buried in a casket. She was buried in the ground where something would decay and she would be back with nature. She didn't want to be embalmed. She wanted to be simply buried. And across on top of that burial site, a tree was planted so that in the years to come, a very large oak tree will be planted and grow. And now you can see it's even more appropriate. I didn't actually think of that connection until a couple of days ago. <laughs> and I was thinking it probably couldn't be more appropriate. Okay, that's my talk. to take questions, Brooke? If you'd like to. I will take questions if I don't hog anybody's time. I'm, I'm ready to quit. I've been working for an hour and a half. <laughs> Does anyone have any burning, uh, there's burning questions? Okay, I have two questions. Thank you for sharing your other with us. Thank you. Um, first of all, did she ever talk about what she thought about moral relativism? And second, did the Vatican ever comment on her work? Or did she ever have any connection with the Vatican? Um, the two good questions. The first question is, she was not a moral relativist, but she was a kind of like, think about it like the text. The text stays in place. It is fixed. Okay. But the different interpretations are significant and varied. And each person's interpretation is their experience of their life. Does that make sense? And hence, she had a great deal of tolerance for a wide variety of different cultures and peoples. So it might look like it is cultural relativism, but through it all, she thought, there's this goodness that is manifesting itself or can manifest itself in various people. She had seen the worst of life, but I never asked her directly what she thought of, other than she would have gone, horrible, terrible, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? As to the second one, my father once said, I don't think the Catholic Church knows what they're getting. Uh, <laughs> by that time, she had definitely left the church. I don't, she had been, she had converted, but she never was at home with like the church part of it. She loved the thinking and the philosophy and the divine that was present. She loved the original scholars. When she first converted, uh, <laughs> uh, to me, this is still a funny story. When she, I was astounded. She had never expressed anything like this to me before. And I know my mother was very anti-authoritarian. That's part of her drive against truth and reason, is that people keep beating each other over the head with this concept of truth, when it isn't truth, it's just a belief. And so I said, are you seriously telling me that you think the Pope is infallible? And she said, no, I don't think that. <laughs> and I went, I thought that was part of being Catholic. And she said, well, that was a modern edition. And I went, modern edition? What are you talking about? She said, well, I was reading the saints in 11 and 1200, and that claim was never there. I'm looking at her puzzled. And she said, yes, the Pope, because again, she's a historian. The Pope, as he got less and less power in this world, he used to have armies and things like that. As he had less and less power in this world, he claimed more and more in the other world. I'm going with the saints of old. Does that make sense? So in one sense, I'm sure the Catholic Church did not know the full depth of it. On the other hand, 
the Catholic Theological University. Ex it was a real seminary. This was something that accepted her fully. She published works with many of the monks and professors who was there. They knew who she was. Does that make sense? And they knew she was a master of the material. And they went, this is who should get this particular position. So I'm not sure the church knew, but anybody who was connected to the university would know. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes. Were there, standpoint, I say moral, not moral, but religious philosophy, uh, what did you think of Thomas Aquinas? I'm sorry? Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was a Christian saint, and I'm not sure what my mother thought of Aquinas. I never heard her speak of Aquinas well. Let me put it that way. <laughs> she was more drawn to, uh, and uh, forgive me for the Dutch, I think it's in English is different, Hildegard von Bingen. Okay? She was drawn to Meister Eckhart. She was drawn to the anti-rational vision of Catholic truth. We forget, and my mother pointed this out to me, we forget when we read what Catholics believe that in point of fact, the Catholic tradition is very rich and you have to do certain things to fall out of bounds with that. And so there's a whole mode of thinking which is very different than the rational sort of things that you might have been told. Does that make sense? And so as a direct result, she was drawn to these other figures that were giving her her rich spirituality. She wanted this non-rational connection to the nature of the good itself. She thought she got it from them. So I never heard her say a bad word about Aquinas. <laughs> I know she knew it well, but I never heard her say a good word about Aquinas either. <laughs> she really did like the name of the rose, by the way. Yeah, I did too. So in the name of the rose, you, the, the philosophy in the name of the rose is apparently top notch. She actually taught medieval philosophy using the name of the rose. Yes. Uh, the note you showed from, from late in her life to herself at home. Yes. She wrote it in English. Yes. Does that mean anything? I mean, what, what, what? That means my mother was a really complicated character who didn't even know what language she was speaking in. My mother, now my father is even more fluent, but would never make this mistake. My father uh, speaks French, German, Dutch, English, knows ancient Greek inside and out so that if I ask him any question about ancient Greek, he would be able to tell me. And if I ask him any question about Latin, he'd be able to tell me. My father once was at a restaurant in France. There were Germans sitting next to us. He was speaking English to me. He was speaking Dutch to his, to his daughter. He was speaking French to the waiter. And the waiter respected his French enough to speak French back. There was a German sitting at the table next to him and said, bitte, können Sie das, and asked for the salt in German. And the Germans looked at him and go, do you speak every language? <laughs> My mother would actually forget what language she's speaking in. So that we would go to a restaurant in Holland, she'd be speaking to in either English or Dutch. But frequently we spoke in English, it didn't matter to me very much. We speak in English, the waiter comes up and asks us for something. She speaks in English to the waiter. I say, Mama, you're in Holland, you can speak Dutch. She goes, oh, yes. And she continues right on speaking English. <laughs> You're still speaking Dutch. No, oh, and then she finally switched to Dutch. It really didn't matter to her what language it was in. She published in German, Dutch, and English. She tailored her publishing to whoever the audience was. She wrote Freud in Holland in Dutch because only Dutch people were going to read that. She wrote the Darwin book in English because she thought that might have a broader audience. She wrote her dissertation in German because nobody writes a dissertation in Dutch because nobody would read it. So she wrote it in German where scholars would actually have a chance to read it. Does that make sense? It was just... It's just part of who she was. She wasn't very good at language because she was very deaf. The bombing and actually some genetic problem made her deaf. And so she couldn't always hear, but she mastered the language. I, I have a, a little story that I always kind of fun, find kind of funny. So I'll give you the story. Um, uh, when I was there, we decided to go to Bonn. She had a conference that she was going to deliver a paper in, and she wanted to deliver the paper in German since it was a, a, a German conference. It wasn't required. She could give it in English, but she knew her German was iffy. She hadn't spoken it in a long time, so she wanted to practice it. So she got one of her students to work with her on German, and, and she wrote the paper in German. She's given the paper, but her German is terrible. And so the student says, I know you're all sympathetic because the German's terrible. You're all are going, she speaks another language? That's good enough for me. Um, but she, her German's terrible. So the student goes, are you sure you have to give this in German? 
And my mother goes, no, no, I don't have to give the German, the singing German, and I keep on working on it. And after miserable German, the student goes, are you really sure you don't have to give it in German? <laughs> and my mother finally dawned on her, oh, you're saying my German isn't good. Okay. But that did not stop my mother. She was undauntable. So she started to work on it even more. Okay. So we go to Bonn. She's worked on her German extensively. We go to Bonn, which happens to be the birthplace of Beethoven. I don't have to tell you about that. You already know that. And we want to go see the birthplace of Beethoven. So I go to, we, we go trying to find it. We can't find it on the map. So my mother decides to use her hard work German and says to the first person who comes by, Bitte, couldn't Sie mir sagen, wo das Beethoven Geburthaus ist? And the person just looked at her as if she was insane and kept walking. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical. Because <laughs> I knew exactly how hard she had worked on this, and I thought it was funny that it was, I'm a terrible son. I thought it was funny. But true to my mother's nature, it didn't, she laughed, and then she just asked the next person. Undaunted. Does that make sense? Other people suffer from anxiety. My mother had the opposite of anxiety. Nothing stopped her. She married who she wanted to marry. She went to university, even though she wasn't supposed to. She got her PhD at a time nobody got her PhD. She did philosophy when women didn't do philosophy. She got a job at a Catholic university when she wasn't Catholic. She was told, don't apply to this. She applied it anyway. She married who she wanted to marry. She lived how she wanted to live. She died how she wanted to die. That's amazing. And at that, I think I'm done. <laughs>